recording. We're in business. Dr. Taryn Thomas from Timmins. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I still remember that I, from first year that you I, introduced yourself that way. It's funny because that like literally stuck with me like through the full, the full four years, like even today. Well, so, give, give some background about that. So for people that are potentially watching that don't know you. Uh, right. So I'm, uh, my name's Taryn Thomas. Um, and I'm from a small town in Northern Ontario called Timmins. And if like a lot of people who were at CMCC weren't really from kind of Northern Ontario, they're a lot like GTA kids. Yeah. Um, so no one really knew where it was, but basically, uh, and, during and CM CMCC is the chiropractic college that you went to. We're both chiropractors. I was yes. a teacher of yours. Yep. So during the kind of like first week of school, you kind of have to go around and introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, that type of thing. And Dr. Nally was one of my like first tutors, yeah. I think first like profs basically in one of my small groups. And you have to go around and introduce yourself. And I said, my name's Taryn Thomas from Tim Timmins. <laughs> and that just stuck through like the whole, my whole schooling. So I'm just Taryn Thomas well, from Timmins. You know, still to this day, that's how I think of you. Because I always remember you saying that when when we were going around. Because yeah. it was a small group that I was teaching you in, which is clinical education in first year. And I remember going around, and you were like, "Hi, I'm Taryn Thomas from Timmins," and it just it flows so perfectly. So, <laughs> and I always that's think about that. It. Yeah, will never forget me. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that that's good background. Obviously, I was. Yeah, you. And in fact, when you started um, at the school as a student, that was my first year teaching so you were part of I think my first group of students um that I ever taught and then you graduated uh last year a year ago right am, am yeah. I yeah yep 2019 you got it yeah so then yeah so you your class was the first set of students that I saw go from first year all the way to fourth year and graduate right. and in fact I you know being faculty there I always get invited to the graduations and I had been invited every year from the first year I worked there and I was sort of like, I'm not going to go to the first one until the people that I've taught in first year are graduating. And so your, your graduation ceremony last year was the first one that I attended um, as faculty. Obviously I attended my graduation back whenever that was 2012, but yeah, it was nice to see you guys um, grow up and, and sort of me asking you to come on today and just speak is, you know, there's a couple of your peers from your class that graduated that even work with me. Um, but I obviously sort of know what's going on in their lives and things like that. But I sort of wanted to connect um, with someone. And, you know, you and I have kept in touch very, like, I guess, infrequently or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought it would be interesting to just have a conversation about how, I mean, you, you potentially picked the, the worst year ever to graduate in terms of, of what's happened <laughs> with COVID-19. But outside of that, yeah. how, how's it all been? Like the, you know, take me from day one of feeling free and and uh, you know, graduating and feeling amazing. I remember that feeling to where you are today. Yeah, no, I definitely, uh, I'd be lying if I said it was, uh, it's been like an easy or kind of like straightforward year kind of thing with the kind of ups and downs of um, COVID and that. Um, basically what, when I graduated, so I had basically figured out a clinic that I wanted to work at. And I think we, we kind of, you knew a little bit about this too, and I won't go into too much detail, but yeah, we don't need names or anything yeah, like no, that. No. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I want to say one thing, like chiropractic school, it does a really great job of really teaching you how to be a good doctor and how to take care of patients. And that's the most important thing by far. Yeah. Um, however, definitely you, you kind of had to really go out of your way to teach yourself a little bit about like contracts and working at clinics and that type of thing. So you kind of learn as you go almost. Um, so anyways, long story short, I had, I had signed a contract, started at a, a clinic in September. So I had a great summer off. I didn't have to work. Um, I couldn't work because I wasn't licensed yet. So I just relaxed and really like decompressed, which I thought was super important. And I spent a lot of time with like my family and friends and just just totally kind of hung out. I traveled and that was all great. And then come September, I started at a clinic. Um, and yeah, it just wasn't really what I kind of thought it was going to be. Um, so I made the decision to leave. Um, had nothing to do with me not being a good practitioner. I just, in my gut, I felt like it wasn't a good fit for me. Um, and to this day, I feel like it's probably one of the best decisions I could have made. So that was kind of like 
you kind of you're excited and you start and it's not really what you thought it was going to be like and it kind of um a little bit discouraging in ways because it's it, it wasn't what i expected like my whole life i've kind of been someone who um who uh, I don't want to say like has dealt with a ton of like failure in that sense because I've always worked hard and tried to achieve like up high expectations for myself I guess so I kind of was a little bit discouraged at this point but I was like it's not a good fit so I ended up leaving and then I kind of didn't really know what I was going to do for about a month um, and then this great opportunity came about at this really established clinic in Burlington which was way closer for me to drive to I'm like in water down so about 50 minutes from Burlington um, it was a very established clinic about eight I think eight or ten years old and they were just switching locations so it was a big brand new like beautiful facility and they had room to hire on another chiropractor so um, I've been working there now since December and it's been amazing um, like I said, it's established. It's more of like a rehab based clinic, not a medical clinic. So a lot of people are coming for chiropractic care, physio and massage. And uh, there's a great team. The clinic owner was like amazing, um, very fair split and everything else. So that worked out great for me. And then it was kind of like, I kind of started getting, um, getting on a roll, like started to get pretty busy. And then in March, COVID happened. So I was like, oh what's my COVID? Goodness. Yeah, so COVID <laughs> happened. Um, and at first, I remember when I first kind of heard about it, like at the end of January, I had this feeling I'm like, this isn't going to be good. Like, I have a feeling this is really gonna, like, I don't know. I don't, I, I just, what made you think that? I, I think I'm a little bit of like a worrier. And I just think it's something that like, I guess in my lifetime, like I was younger when like SARS happened and stuff like that. So I didn't really appreciate how big of deal I guess it was but then right. being a practitioner and being in such close contact with people every day I was just kind of like if this doesn't go away and I'm treating people in such confined spaces and we're in close contact as a chiropractor I'm like I don't know if this is going to be like I don't know how this is going to work or like if they're going to find uh, like a solution for this but I just I obviously kind of put that at the back of my mind because I just wanted to continue to practice um and then, yeah, that kind of happened. So I uh, wasn't working. I was doing a little bit of virtual care during that time. So about March, like the second week of March or third week of March until uh, basically the beginning of June when everything kind of started to open up again. Um, and I wasn't very busy. I mean, as a new, new practitioner, I didn't have very many like regular patients kind of um, who, who would benefit maybe from like the virtual care and the exercise and stuff like that I know the physios like they were a little bit busier just because they had started programs with people um, like previous to COVID starting and they wanted to finish them through virtual so it's just a bit different than like the hands-on stuff that we do yeah um, so yeah again it was kind of like another like hard hit but then I started back again and honestly I'm so pleasantly surprised that people are not as hesitant to yeah. come and receive like chiropractic care like I was I was a little bit nervous about that mm -hmm. and that I thought um like you know it's going to take a while for people to warm up to the idea of coming back to a clinic and being in such close proximity to us and everything else but our clinic's done a great job and I think our college has done a great job of giving us the proper guidelines and um, following them and I've received a lot of feedback from patients just basically saying that they feel very safe with our care yeah because we have all these protocols in place. So I don't know about you, but I, I yeah. think kind of pretty quickly after we opened. I, I would agree with you in terms of being pleasantly surprised. I mean, when, when, when I opened up all the clinics that we have again, you know, obviously I was worried in terms of what the demand would be like, but you're right. The demand has actually been quite high. In fact, most of the, the modifications or the, the slowdown that we've had is a result of just having a, you know, more time between patients and, and things like that to ensure physical yeah, distancing. Great. But in terms of demand, which is, I mean, the, the biggest thing in any industry, um, it seems to be there. I actually like sort of reflecting back on this, I think, I think had, and I, I think sort of people got to the point where they were just sick of this, right? Like the average person, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't, if I didn't feel sick of it, right? So I think everybody is sort of got into a point where they're like, enough is enough. Like I want to get back to my life. And I think people are sort of more willing to take even the calculated risk for themselves. Um, and, and I think if this had only been like, you know, a two week shutdown or a three week shutdown, I actually think it would be the opposite where people would have said, this is way too early. I'm not going anywhere. I'm hesitant. Like 
and you know as this thing has evolved and we've seen research where you know it's maybe not as bad as everyone originally thought it it doesn't tend to spread through asymptomatic patients as likely as we thought and all of these things um and you know now testing is more rampant so i think like it sort of it worked out well in the sense that i think when we did finally get to go back like you're saying um i think most people feel safe enough to want to take um those calculated risks to say and i mean it's hard for people to put healthcare on on pause right for and, sure. and with what I do through the radio, I, I, I maintained everything I did through radio and, and speaking with the average patient, it was not good, right? Like, and, and we're not dealing with life-threatening things. And people even had like their life-threatening surgeries that were delayed and things like that. So uh, it's a tough thing to put healthcare on, on pause for sure. Um, so I, I guess to not go down the, the COVID-19 rabbit hole, but um, Another thing that's interesting for me is this idea when all of this happened was, and you sort of brought it up with the virtual care and, and, you know, every business was sort of looking for a way on how can we do things differently. And I just, you know, I, I don't know what it was like for you, but I, I think from what I've seen at our clinics and even what I think other people that own clinics that I know that I've spoken to and other practitioners, I mean, the idea of virtual care for, a procedural profession like chiropractic or physiotherapy or massage or any type of like healthcare, like dentistry, optometry, where you actually have to do something with someone. It's, it's a tough sell, right? Because right. I don't think people really are looking for that. And I know you mentioned the physios may have been busier and even ours, like potentially with some rehab stuff, but it's really, I don't think any, you know, physio, chiro, massage, dentist, whatever it may be, could ever make a real living on virtual care. Is that something that, you know, you found a, Definitely. Yeah. It's um, like, I really try to implement and incorporate a lot of active care and like rehab into my treatments. However, it's not like solely rehab based. I do usually I do about like my appointments are usually about half an hour and involve about 15 minutes of manual care, like hands-on adjusting soft tissue. And then I'll usually, I do a lot of acupuncture in practice. So I'll put them patient on needles for about 15 minutes and I have access to the two rooms so I'll be able to go treat someone else so a lot of it is like hands-on at the very end of the appointment I'll kind of do a re regroup or kind of I'll go over the exercise that we've been doing and then I usually communicate with patients via email with like exercise plans that I've made for them right. um, so a lot of it's like I explain the exercise and make sure they're doing it right but then they do their homework at home so it was kind yeah. of like a lot of the patients I was seeing already had their exercises that were kind of helping them and they were responding well so it wasn't really I find like I didn't really have a, a, a place to kind of like recruit new patients for this type of thing. Like yeah, a lot would, of people just it would be hands tough. on. Kind of like, yeah, it was def definitely be tough. And I don't think it could could have been like, sustained to make to make a living like as a yeah. Cairo. For and and, and a I thought it was interesting because so many people were talking about like businesses need to find a way to do things differently. And it's like, you know, there's just some things out there that can't really be done differently. And I And I really mm -hmm. feel like the procedural healthcare professions like one place where it seems to be working well in healthcare is like the example of walk-in clinics we have one clinic um where there's a walk-in component um and that actually works quite well because i mean anyone that's ever been to a walk-in doctor really the majority of it is a conversation and then it's really just like a quick triage and like you know here are some things to manage it in the meantime but if it's something more serious you'd have to go get it investigated further with a specialist or whatever. So I think there's a place for virtual care and that type of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. My role, like where I do mainly, I don't really treat anymore, but doing new patient mm -hmm. assessments, it uh, seems to work well for me for the MSK stuff, like the musculoskeletal stuff. Uh, but yeah. again, I've sort of built that where I'm only focused on that. And I think again, for, you know, the, the average chiropractor that is, is treating it and does a great job treating, I just don't think there's any way to replace human touch, right? Like where you're doing your manual care and exactly. you're trying to have an, a desired effect with your hands. I don't, I don't know how you exactly. ever achieve that. There might be a role, I guess, for virtual care, like in terms of follow-up appointments, like you've said, right. instead of, you know, like having someone come back in for their exercises, maybe you can walk them through on, on a virtual mm -hmm. thing. But I think, uh, yeah, I yeah. think what we do is really much is, is, is the way it is for a reason. Definitely. Agree. Um, for sure. So outside of like the COVID-19 thing, um, I guess one question that I have for you is like, what has, well, two questions, I guess. So number one, what's been the worst thing 
about your first year out as a chiropractor and then to what's been your best, the best thing about being uh, your first year out as a chiro. Okay. Well, that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I definitely, I'll, I'll start off by saying, I think there's definitely more good than there was like bad. Yeah. Um, I think that when you graduate, like you have this doctor title now, you have all the knowledge and you're like ready to go. But I think that it kind of almost hits you like a brick wall when you really need to realize like, I need to be an entrepreneur and yeah. I need to like hustle and I need to do all of this extra work, even though I've done eight years of school now, all these extra courses, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on education. And it's like, you can be the best the best Cairo ever that have the best skills, have the best clinical knowledge. Um, but if you don't have that like ambition or hustle to try to recruit new patients, to try to get involved in your community. And you're like, this is what you are so good at. Like you're obviously a great Cairo, but like you have that, you need to have that kind of edge to you where you, you need to realize that patients aren't just going to start walking through your door because they heard Taryn Thomas from Timmins is now a Cairo. So no. <laughs> That's catchy Cairo, though. I think, I think people yeah. would walk through the door for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think that that was for me just because I, I think that I like in your head as a new grad, you just, you're going to be this great doctor, but then it's like a huge part of it is being an entrepreneur. And like, if you're not seeing patients, you could sit there all day. If like you're on a salary, it's different, but we're not for the most part, it's an independent yeah. contract or so. And that's stuff that you don't learn too much about in school. So it kind of was like, whoa, like I really need to put in now like all this other work so I mean at the same time though it was kind of like so realizing that and realizing I still had a lot of work to do um in terms of like recruiting patients and it's it's one of those things where you want to do it in a tasteful way like you don't just want to cold call people or right. whatever you have to figure out like what are the best ways to recruit patients and to also um like we're work like smarter, not harder almost. So like, for example, I started doing um, like mobility workshops at like F45s and like different gyms. And I did um, a few like chamber of commerce kind of like um, trade show things. And I tried to, I'm not from Burlington. I'm not from this area. My fiance is. So I had like his family kind of like help me out in a way, but definitely making those like important connections. Um, it, it's, it's basically can make or break like your practice um so that I think is very challenging and I'm still I'm still finding that a challenge like now being I guess I'm almost like a year graduated but I've only really been working at this clinic full-time in December so I worked like December January February half of March was off for three months and now I've been back for about a month so I've only really had like like less than half a year I guess of actual practice right. um so I definitely felt like like that's what's something that I still really need to kind of like work with. And like I said, I'm thankful that the clinic I'm at, um, I'm with two other chiros, uh, two physios and massage therapists, but the two chiros have been there for a long time. They have kids. They um, basically want to, they shuffle me a lot of new patients. Like, so because they have such a great establishment of their kind of like regular patients right. already. So that worked out really well for me yeah. um, and it's still working well, but I think that is definitely been the biggest challenge is just kind of like it's um it's, it's kind of sometimes like at the beginning a bit discouraging because you've done all this hard work already and it's not like medicine where you just kind of started a clinic and people roll in it's kind of like why am I going to come see you as a chiro over so well, long so, yeah and and, and I don't even think it's so else. much medicine versus chiro what I think it is is public versus private health care right so exactly. e even if, if we went down to the states for family doctors like people interview for their family doctor in the States, right? Like they're trying to earn a patient. Um, whereas here it's the total opposite mentality in the public system, because it's a public system, you don't have much choice. You just sort of go with it. Like, I mean, all a family doctor has to do is, is open up a location, say I'm accepting patients and, and they're full within a very short period of time because there's a shortage, all of these things. But I think anywhere where you're dealing in the private sector of healthcare, like chiro, physio, massage, yeah. dentistry, optometry, podiatry, like all of these other allied health professions, you do really yeah. need to, and, and I, you know, and maybe, and I guess another question that I have for you, because I teach at the school and I teach first year a lot, and that's where I taught you. 
-hmm. I think I try to set out a realistic expectation of practice. Like, I think I try to allude to this where it's not like you're going to graduate and on day one, the floodgates open just because, you know, you can have the, it's like you said, it doesn't matter. You can have the best like branding, the best slogan, you can have the perfect location. You still have to do sort of what you did and, and you've suggested where you get involved. People find out about you. You tastefully, you know, one thing that I've always said is you've got to showcase your knowledge in a tasteful way and you let people make the decision for themselves because once they hear you speak, they'll say, wow, you know, Taryn seems really knowledgeable. I really, you know, I have a back problem anyways. I want to go see her. That's the right way to do it. Um, but so is there something more, I guess, when you reflect back on your education, right? Because I think part of my role of being an instructor is I, I also want to make sure that the future for future chiropractors is potentially better. Is there more that, you know, myself, I could do to elaborate on that or even the school in general? Like, are there thoughts that you've ever had about that? Yeah, I mean, so it's funny that you're saying all that stuff because I remember like you kind of alluding to like the stuff about business just because you're very like business savvy, business oriented and you kind of incorporate that into like, even in first year, I remember you saying, stuff about how it's important to like learn to be a bit of an entrepreneur and stuff like that but it just kind of gets almost um not over I guess yeah it kind of gets over um overdone by like uh like all the kind of like the medical stuff like the science and everything else so I think it'd be beneficial if we learned a little bit more about the business aspect I know when I was in my fourth year at CMCC at the college they implemented this like online business module however it was just a very kind of um basic general one and it wasn't specific to that of like a chiropractor so I remember it was like online um I, I obviously I've completed it and I it, it worked out well but it still didn't really give me that great of an idea of like everything I kind of still had to learn um so I think maybe having a bit more of like a business kind of class even if it was just like one or two mods or something like one mod and like a few rounds of it or something in like your clinical year and you could like depending to like I had good clinicians who kind of talked a little bit about that um but some clinicians they might not really mention that so it, it just depends on who you got there but i think that yeah having maybe like a few rounds presentations or um just like an actual class that you had to go to and you had to like learn about it take notes and almost be tests on it because then i feel like you remember it better that would be good and also just learning a bit more about contracts like what do certain things mean? Because that's just like a whole other can of worms. But it, when it comes down to it, it's so important because the clinic could be great. Um, like the setup could be great. It could sound great. But then there's these things in the contract that could actually like really hold you back yeah. kind of thing. So just, I, I feel as though that, that part's really important. But, um, and I know you did like a business club like, did you, did you do business uh, so, club? So the there, club there is a business club at the school and I was asked to speak there a few times, but I never, right. okay. I, I'm not, I'm not the organizer of it or anything sure. like that. Yeah. I think I went to the ones that you, that you did, but it was again, one of those things that would, you'd finish clinic, you'd be tired, you want to like go home kind of thing. So yeah. it wasn't um, like mandatory, but I think that implementing something like that would be, be good just because it gets you thinking a little bit more. Um and yeah, so I think that's probably the biggest thing for the, me. The, the one thing that's interesting about business, and I, and I appreciate what you said about me having some type of business knowledge or whatever it is, um, you know, I, the, the reality is the, the one thing that I've learned, like, I mean, I've never had any formal business training. Like I always studied sciences mm -hmm. in high schools, uh, sciences in, in university, and then obviously chiropractic. So my business training was zero. Like, um, and in fact, it's, it's so bad that right now I'm doing my MBA part-time because I, I run a big enough business that I feel like I should know some stuff about business. So I'm doing that now to formalize my knowledge. But I guess the only insight that I have for sort of new grads and what I tell them is that, you know, you could probably, even if, if, even if we held a class and we taught you everything that I think I know, there's always mm -hmm. going to be something else, right? And I think, I think sure. business is sort of like life. It's sort of like you have to go through these things. And that's yeah. really what ingrains it. And I even, even with what you do on the clinical side with patients, like you learned a lot of stuff, right? But it's not until that moment that you have a patient, that you interact with them in a certain way, you see something, you have to do some more research that, you know, something comes into your head that you had never thought of before, that that really starts yeah. to build you as a practitioner. So I think the reality about a lot of these things is too that, 
you know, I agree with you. I think there should be a little bit more, like some more foundational things, like some things that are consistently true, right? Like the amount of times I ask a student, do you know the difference between income tax, payroll tax, and HST? And then the answer is like, no. It's like, well, you should know that because at some point, those are all things that might be very real um, for you to, to consider. And so there's some foundational stuff for sure that I think needs mm -hmm. to be there. But I also think that it's also about experience. And like, you'll look back sure. in five years when, and, and you'll be a business person, but you won't be a business person necessarily because you have any formal education, but because you have the school of hard knocks, like you went through it sure. because you yeah. went through it. Like, you know, the stuff you're saying is the knowledge, right? That you can impart to on, on younger grads and let them know, like what you said there about contracts, like, yeah, a contract. Right. And listen, a contract is important on both sides, right? Whether it's for the, the person that is being given it and the person who's, who's giving it, because there are things that are stipulated in there. It can also protect you in other ways, but you're absolutely right. You, you have to be able to understand um, the wording in there. And I think, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I think new grads, I, I know in speaking with a few of them, and I speak to a lot, I actually I should say more than a few, a lot of people ask my opinion on this stuff they sort of get hung up on some of the wrong things, right? Like sometimes they right. get hung, you know, like the big thing that I think everybody thinks about is the split, right? And, and the one thing that I've always tried to encourage people is like, you know, splits matter, but it also matters how busy you're going to be, right? Because if you had, if you go work somewhere and it's busy and, and it's 50-50 or something like that, well, that's more money than being somewhere that's not busy and 90-10. So I think, you know, it's also about perspective, I think, is the important thing in trying to consider that stuff. For sure. Yeah, no, those are all very great points. I think, like, just like you said, it kind of like you learn more about the business aspect of it with experience. And that takes time, unfortunately, like most good things. Um, but I learned, like, from my first experience so much about everything that I kind of was confused about when I initially went into it. And now I'm kind of, I feel like I'm like bulletproof. If I ever get another contract ever again, I know exactly like what to look at. I know things to like look out for things to question, like things that I have the right to question. Like you just, I didn't really know all that kind of stuff off the bat, but now I do. And even in terms of like the business, like how, how things work, like what an independent contractor actually is versus like an employee and like, um, just like, yeah, questioning things that you're not really sure of. So I think that I learned so much from that, um, whole experience and even working in a clinic that's so different than a clinic that I'm working at now, but I wouldn't have known any of that if I just would have either stayed there and stuck it out or, um, maybe started a different clinic. So I think that it's like you said, experience is so like invaluable when it comes to like this profession and, the more you're in it, the more you learn. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. Like you said, like there's patients that come in and it's not just, oh, I have mechanical neck pain and back pain. It's like, I have this weird burning pain down the side of my leg. It's started like, you, you kind of have to, again, like put your, your like study glasses on and just like kind of dig into it. And it's definitely a career where you're continuing to research like everything all the time. Like it doesn't right. stop at your schooling. It's definitely very involved, I think, which yeah. is good because it keeps you like stimulated. It keeps you on your toes. Um, and yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's important. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the reality with pretty much anything in life. It's really the experience component that often matters more than any of the formal stuff, but, but yeah, for sure. I think the the foundational stuff is important. Like, I mean, you couldn't have been a chiropractor without the foundational knowledge. You can't just see a patient right. and figure it out. So same thing. So I do think maybe some level uh, uh, specifically on the business side, but you know, the other thing that you mentioned there that I think is important is those like, you know, I'm, I'll term it a failure, but it doesn't sound like it was a failure to be at that clinic because you learn something, right? And I think really in life, when you could take something that is maybe not the best experience, but learn from it and grow from it, that's a great thing. I actually think you, you like you're an example of someone who's as an individual, you are trying to do better for yourself because you also had another option. The other option is just stick it out and suck it up. Right. And, and right. what does that do for you? Probably nothing good. So I think that's the other aspect of this is like, you've also got to go with your gut to some extent. And I remember, I remember you going through this and you actually had called me to sort of get my right. opinion on the contract and all this stuff. Um, and I think at some point, and I would have said something along, the, along those lines, like typically people know inside what feels right, what feels wrong. Sure. And you really do. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the, the real success in life is waking up every day and making sure that you, you know, you're, 
you're enjoying what you're doing. And, I, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm very realistic in the sense that like, I don't believe life should be every minute is perfect and it's all marshmallows everywhere and blah, blah, blah. I just mean like, you know, if you're waking up more days hating everything than you are, you know, loving things, then I think that's where you need to evaluate. Of course, there's good and there's bad in everything. And I'm sure, you know, even if we nitpick that whatever clinic you're at, there's, there's things you might hate about it or whatever. Like, but the reality is you've got to really look at those pros and cons. And if more days than not, you're enjoying what you're doing, I think that's really what success is. Yeah, definitely. That's, um, that's really true. And that's kind of a good leeway into the best part of practicing as a new grad. Um, it's exactly that. It's patients coming in, they're feeling better with your care. Um, they're referring pa patients to you. I have a lot of patients who come um, and then they refer their husband or their wife or their daughter or son. Um, so that is very like fulfilling and it really reinforces like why you put so much work into what you do. Right. Um, and yeah, like just people or some people too, like they'll, they'll come in from Instagram. Like they'll be like, yeah, I've been following you for a while. Like kind of gives you a bit of credibility having like a decent kind of so, like social media platform. One thing I wanted to talk to you about, cause I do follow you on social and, and you do a very good job and you have a, you have a big following. Like, how did you do all of that? I think that's really interesting. And I think, and the other thing that I like about like, I mean, I have social media. I, I do all this stuff too. I don't, I don't do it myself. I have a, uh, my social media manager, because I suck at all that stuff, but I realize <laughs> how important it is. Um, yeah, that stuff. But I'm also someone that looks at social media. And most of the time, like 90% of the time, I think it's actual BS. Like I just look at it. And I'm like, this stuff is so stupid. It's so like, fake and whatever. But actually, when I look at your Instagram, and with what you're doing, you're actually providing real advice for people, whether you do a lot of stuff on nutrition, stuff on exercise, even just stuff in, in general about life. Like how can you like, you know, I've seen posts where you say like, you know, yesterday you may have had a bad day with eating or something like that. And then like you sort of walk what you did today to make yourself feel better. And so I actually think you're being really very real, which I, I think is good. And I appreciate that, but sort of walk me through how you did all that, because I think especially in today's day and age, like that's the new form of, of really networking and doing things. And I, I'm, I don't think people should forget the other stuff, like you've said, like getting involved in the community, but this is a virtual community. And, and, it, and it's in, the, in, in some way almost the same thing. But how did you start doing all that? Like what sort of made it springboard for you? Yeah, no, well, thank you so much for um, the compliments. Um, I kind of started off with that page, like, while I was in university, just as a kind of a hobby, I kind of got into, like, eating a little bit healthier, um, and I just kind of really, I, I liked it as kind of like a hobby almost, and then once I started kind of getting a little bit of the following, and then once I um, started chiropractic school, I was learning all this stuff that was basically... Um, like all good information that would help people kind of maximize their wellness basically that's what my whole platform is kind of about is like how can I make a difference in this person's life or day or whatever just with like these little kind of um, like plans of action I guess you could say so right. I kind of started off just as a hobby and then I kind of started to gain a following and then people would kind of message me or comment or whatever just saying like thank you so much for this information I really appreciate it and that was kind of reinforced like why I put so much time into it because um, right. it does take a lot of time I'm not gonna yeah. lie it takes a lot of time to put in like content that's actually just not kind of um, like kind of fluffy like you said um, it takes time but I think that by people um like letting you know that it really helped them in a way i think that for me is like that's why i do it that's what drives me to do it and yeah. a lot of it i kind of take from my practice and just kind of um i kind of tweak it in a way i guess because it's a lot of different things like nutrition everything and sleep and all these kind of pillars of health i call them um but yeah i try to be transparent with my social media and my practice because that's how i am in practice and that's how i kind of am in real life and i just think that if i can help people um in any way i can with any bit of advice that i have as a, a cairo um i think for me that's what that's why i do it um yeah. so okay. yeah I, and I'll, I'll tell you, you're on the right track. And I'm going to tell you this based on my experience, but also I just finished my marketing class in my MBA. And we always think of marketing like in the traditional sense where, you know, you spend a dollar and you expect a return on that investment in terms of an advertising dollar that someone comes in and sees you where, and that's sort of an old school way of thinking of marketing, really the new age of marketing 
is exactly what you said. And you don't even think, I don't think you realize what you're doing, but it's, it's really the most um, up-to-date form of marketing, which is you're providing value to people mm -hmm. without a, an expectation of anything in return. And I think that's the right way to do it. I also think when it comes to healthcare, that's the tasteful way, right? Like that's the way and sort of what I alluded to. You, you provide people with your knowledge. You share the things that you know that you know could help people. People can choose to consume it or not choose to consume it. And those that do consume it are going are gonna to really, you know, and there'll come a time where, like you've said, there's the trickle down effect that all of a sudden they've paid attention to you for so many things that, you know, one day they hurt their knee or something and they need somebody to look at their knee anyways. And it's like, well, I'm going to go to Dr. Thomas because I mean, I follow her anyway. She gives me all these amazing tips on everything else. She's knowledgeable and that's where I want to see it. So you're, you're doing the best type of marketing. I think that really exists out there. And, and it, you know, whether you realize that or not, I also think to some extent you've set a trend within the chiropractic community because I've seen more people uh, start like similar pages like you have. Um, I don't know if necessarily you were the first, you're the first that I know of. So I'm going to give you credit. <laughs> um, whether, whether there's, there, I'm sure there's been other people, whatever. I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything, but I, I think it's a good thing. You're providing real value to people. And again, I think it's very tasteful stuff. Like I'd be the first one to, to call BS on something if it wasn't tasteful. And I, and I hate that stuff. Like it's so yeah. fake. Like when, you know, uh, so I think the fact that you're providing real stuff um, and showing who you really are, I, I, I think I, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure um, your other followers appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. It's um, like, yeah, like you said, it's um, it just it builds credibility. So it's not like I'm like fetching patients. I'm trying like fishing for patients or um, it, it's that obvious, but it's, yeah, it builds credibility. People kind of, they put their trust in you. Um, they like what you're doing. You, they can kind of relate to you because you seem like a real person, not this yeah. Cairo or doctor. You're just being, being you and offering um, your knowledge in a way that's um, like tasteful and also understandable, like to someone at a level who's who maybe not as educated as you are in like the Cairo world. So I think that's a, that's a really important thing is to be transparent and um, like relatable. I think is is huge for that. Yeah, and and I think another thing that I I'd, I'd love to hear sort of what you have to say about this because I think you you do a really good job. I mean, I can tell you from personal experience when I first graduated. Um, in terms of the practice side of things and business, I think I did really well. Uh, but in terms of managing myself, like as a human being, my health, my wellness, I probably sacrificed some of that in order to, to do some other things. And I know you seem to do a very good job on an overall well, well balance, right? Like where you're, you're making sure that you're doing what you need to do in practice, but you're also, you know, I saw that you got engaged. Congratulations. Like you're living your life, you're planning your future. You, you find time to exercise, you eat healthy, uh, you socialize with friends, like all of these things. Walk me through that because I think that's an important thing for new graduates. Like it, it's one thing when people say to me, if you could go back and change anything, what would you change? And my response consistently is not sacrificing myself for everything else, right? Because I, to some extent I did that, I've gotten back into my routine of doing the things that I wanted to do. But there was a period of time where I did sacrifice a lot of my own well-being, my stress, my health, all of this stuff to sort of do things. And I don't recommend that. So I think it's important for people to hear mm -hmm. from people like you who have found a way to be well-balanced. Definitely, it's so, it's so important. Um, I know as an individual, I'm someone who kind of gets stressed out a little bit easier, I guess, than some. Like my fiance, he's very like relaxed, very kind of like chill, just kind of like, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. Whereas I'm a little bit more, um, I, I stress, I worry and that type of thing. And I definitely I get that from my mom. Um, but anyways, because I'm that <laughs> shout out to person, mom. <laughs> yeah, shout out to my mom, thanks. Um, but because I'm that type of person, I think for me, like the most important thing about managing stress and like maintaining a balanced lifestyle is to stay ahead of it. So like, instead of being reactive to stress, I think being proactive is like so important and stress is different for everyone, like in, in every different situation, but um, there are ways that we can all kind of try to stay ahead of it with things that we maybe um, like benefit from and like reducing our stress. So like um, when I first started out, I wasn't, wasn't very busy, but I knew I had to kind of like, 
put in time to like hustle and get patients and everything else. And initially I was kind of like overwhelmed and I was feeling stressed and I wasn't sleeping as well. And I just kind of started realizing how, like, I, I just felt like tired. I didn't feel like myself. I kind of felt foggy and I was like, okay, I need to get ahead of this. I need to become more organized. And I think being organized for me and trying to stay ahead of stress is the most important thing um, that you can, like, personally, I think this, I don't know if it works for everyone, but being organized and having um, even your days almost organized to a T, which sounds like a lot of work, but it's really not. Um, so things that I started doing because I started feeling overwhelmed is I would do something called time batching. And I did this in Cairo school too. And this is what really helped me kind of get through um, school and like stay organized. But basically every day I have like a little day planner and I just, it's, it's um, organized like in an hourly fashion so I just kind of write down all of these basically like important tasks that I have to do throughout the day um, but instead of just writing them down I kind of try to put, put them in like a time like slot yeah. so if for example I have like a workout slot in there I have um, pre-clinic prep like if I want to research something for a patient in there like like at a, like at a certain time so I know that yeah. I'm you know, kind of, I like to check things off the list. That's the type of person I am. So time batching was huge and staying organized. Um, that really helps me feel a bit more at ease, seeing my whole day out in front of me, seeing that I've accomplished some of it at the end of the day. I just, for me, it makes me feel at ease. I, I um, think that's, and sorry to interrupt you, but I think that's a yeah, big no. thing that higher education sort of helps to, to teach people. Cause I think anybody that went through something like chiropractic college, like we did, you had to do that in order to really get through it. I, I mean, I still do it to this day. I think most people that are um, successful at what they do, like that, that's a huge thing, having a schedule, making sure that you're following things and having outlines. So, so yeah, I think that, 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 and there's tons of wellness, like self-help books out there that suggest this type of For stuff, sure. like become organized. Like it's, yeah. it's one of the very simple yeah. things that you can do, um, which will help you. So sorry to interrupt, but I, I think that's an important thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so true. Um, so yeah, that for me is like one of the biggest things being organized because no matter what life kind of throws at you, at least, you know what, I can try to organize it and, um, not get too overwhelmed if I don't have to. Right. Um, I, I think that having a balance, um, in terms of basically like, so sleeping well, eating well and exercising when you can, I know when I'm doing all three of those things, I feel like my absolute best self and I have right. to make time for that. So, um, usually at the beginning of a week, like on a Sunday, I'll, I'll meal prep like my lunches for the week, or I'll do a little bit of a prep. I'll kind of have those meals ready to go. So again, I don't have decision fatigue the next day. I'm not rushing. I have that organized. So that's done. My food's done. I'm going to eat well, I'll be fueled well for my day and I'll perform the best I can basically because of it. Um, and then I always try to make time to exercise. So there's, as everyone knows, there's so many like benefits to exercise. For me, it's definitely my kind of my first outlet, like my first kind of um, thing that I like to use to, to de-stress or stay ahead of my stress. Um, releases endorphins, makes us feel good. It helps us sleep better. There's all of these benefits. Um, so for me, I know I, I don't have any kids right now. Like I don't have that busy of a life, but um, I have to, like, I still make time for exercise. So if I'm waking up at 5.30 to exercise, like I'm, because that's the only time I can do it that day, like I will do it. Um, and I definitely always feel better after it. So it's, it's about like making time to have that exercise time and it doesn't have to be a crazy workout. Like that's what I kind of like to tell people. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be an hour, like hit workout. That's going to like kill you kind of thing. It can be a 20 minute walk in the morning with your coffee, get your 3000 steps. Like that will be good for the day. Well, so I think having that mindset's important yeah and and one thing that like i mean this all sort of relates to to covid19 in the sense like one of the things that i've been trying to really preach especially on the radio show which goes out to like the live audience um and the average person is like there are things in life that we're never going to be able to control like viruses pathogens uh, all these other things that can affect us but that doesn't mean that we can't do anything about it i mean the having a well-balanced diet right which again none of this stuff is rocket science like anybody that tries to make this rocket science is just crazy like a well-balanced yeah. diet and moderate physical activity a few times a week which could be exactly what you said just a simple walk like where you're just slightly increasing your heart rate is shown to improve yeah. immune function it's shown to uh, decrease all-cause mortality all of these things and like the fact that people exactly. don't understand that or they don't want to believe that to me is crazy. And, and another thing, like, I mean, I have a young child. And so what I can tell you too, is like, you do run out of time. 
But the other thing that it's sort of like what we do in a clinical setting with prehabilitation before someone has to go through something like surgery, which is a difficult time. Like, yeah, the first year of having a child is a difficult time, but you're doing the right thing by prepping yourself. Yeah, maybe during that year of your of having a child, you may not have as much time to exercise, but you can build yourself up to a certain point where you can then, even if you fall off a little, you're not falling off from the bottom of like never doing anything. You're falling off from a higher point and then, you know, you can get back into the swing of things. So in a sense, staying healthy is even for those potential downtimes in life, right? And like, this is what Absolutely. surgeons always look at when someone's about to go into surgery. It's like, well, what's your overall health anyways? Like, that's going to help me yeah. or someone or, or a surgeon determine what is your eventual outcome? What's your prognosis? Like how being healthy in advance, it's the way you use for prognosis too with patients with low back, exactly. neck pain. It's like, well, you're already healthy. That's a positive prognostic finder. So yeah, I mean, Absolutely. that's, that's all great stuff. Sorry to interrupt you again, but I thought it related yeah, no, to other things. This is, I like the com I like the conversation. It's good. Um, yeah. So basically, yeah, being organized and trying to stay ahead of the stress is really important. Making that time to exercise is important. Um, making the time to make healthier choices, I think is, um, it's basically, it's another thing too. Like some people get so overwhelmed about like, oh, I need to like start eating healthy. I'm going to just cut out all carbs and I'm going to just drink green juice and like just, they go from one extreme to the next, but that's yeah. totally not sustainable yeah. in the long run. Um, and you don't feel good about it because usually you, you do something that extreme and then you bounce back to old habits and you feel, you feel guilty. So, um, things that I'll kind of tell patients, like, because as a chiropractor, you can discuss nutrition to a certain extent and give a few kind of just general uh, words of advice. So like staying hydrated, just avoiding um, like added sugar and trying to eat a more whole foods based diet. So I tell patients like whole foods means one ingredient. So for example, a dinner, a whole foods based dinner would be be um, like some some roasted veggies like broccoli or something some sweet potato um, some chicken and lemon water or something like that so it's all simple ingredients I'm not adding in processed stuff and then basically sugar is kind of um, the sneaky thing right it's like the thing yeah. that's in everything it's very inflammatory and everything else so if you can just make little changes like that they'll kind of add up over time and I think people once they start eating a little bit better, they really realize how much better they feel. Like they yeah. realize they don't have as much brain fog and they realize their digestion's better and they're sleeping better. So it's kind of like they get hooked on that. And then once they kind of, they get on with that role, it just kind of sticks and then they, they don't really want to go back. Um, and then all these other good things happen. Like, yeah, sleeping better, like weight loss um, and that type of thing. So I think that it's with nutrition, it's kind of like taking baby steps and also educating yourself too. Um, like there's so many diets these days, like keto, vegan, whatever. And every, every diet, there's different diets that are better for different people. people yeah. But when it comes down to it, the principle of just eliminating some processed foods, yeah. um, drinking more water, eating more like kind of like uh, foods. whole foods based. Those yeah. are all, yeah. Real foods. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not rocket science. Like and then said. that's, it's that's like, what I always say. Like it's, it's about finding what works for you, but like at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it, none of it is rocket science. The other thing I think no. that is, you know, that is a factor for people is that I guess, and, and it's sort of like society's fault in a way for setting it up this way, but there's this thought like where health means like physical appearance, right? And like, you don't have to, you know, have washboard abs and, and that means you're healthy because I know plenty of people that are just naturally lean and muscular yeah. and whatever, but they're horrible. They smoke, they drink, they eat processed Absolutely. food. So from a health perspective, like if we took a vial of their blood and looked at things like triglyceride levels and blah, 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 they'd be horrible, right? And they don't feel well, they don't sleep well. And I think that's one thing that I try to encourage people to like, I mean, in my own life, I could agree with that. There's been times like when I was younger, I was in very, very good shape. Um, I'm not in as good of a shape as I used to be, of course. Uh, but I try to still eat healthy, exercise, yeah get good sleep, like all these things that you've suggested. And I think it's important for people to realize like you need to, and, and oftentimes they correlate, of course, because when you're doing the right things, then your body will start to look a certain way just by the very nature of how they're intertwined. But that doesn't always need to be the case. Like it, The goal should not no. be the aesthetic appearance of, of what you're trying to do, but really, are you being healthy? Do you have the energy that you need? Are you performing the way you want to perform? Are you the you know, the, the chiropractor you want to be in terms of energy levels, are you the wife, the husband, all of these things um, are, are, I think, the really, the essence of, of health. And I think 
that gets lost. Is that something that you find with, with people, oh, yeah. especially the people you interact with? For sure. I, uh, I think that's definitely fair to say. And I also think because of things, for example, like social media, there's all these like fitness influencers and all these people yeah. who really aren't that healthy. They're like depriving themselves of working out three times a day. Sure. Do they have washboard abs and nice biceps and everything else? Yes. But are they really healthy? Probably not. Right. Um, and like I said, that type of lifestyle is usually not sustainable in the long run. Um, and, also and that's too, also like, their, their jobs. Like some of these people that becomes like, right. it's everything about their lives. Like it's, it's everything. Exactly. So I mean, if that was anybody's job, you could achieve that. But other people have jobs, they have families, they have all these other things. Yeah. So you've got yeah. to be realistic too. Definitely. Yeah. Not, and not compare yourself to these like Fitspo, or whatever, um, like weightlifters and stuff like that. I think that's really important and not and not, uh, it's not good to get caught up in that kind of idea. Um, uh, what else was I going to say about that? I cut you oh, off. I think Sorry. being too, so yeah, no, it's okay. I think um, eating too for like, brain health, like that kind of, I don't want to say it gets lost, but um, like eating the foods that are good for your brain. I think that's kind of another way that I kind of organize my diet. Um, there's a really good book called Genius Foods by yeah. uh, someone named Max Lugavere. It's an awesome book. Um, and there's basically like 10 genius foods and he tries to incorporate them into his diet uh, every day, like in certain ways. So for for example, things that I always take are like MCT oil. I usually have that in my coffee. So the medium chain triglycerides, yeah. um, they're found in things like coconut oil. And basically because of their like molecular um, kind of structure, they're able to kind of surpass a certain digestive step and actually kind of go right to the brain for fuel. So it's funny, like I'll usually have that every day in my coffee, just about half a tablespoon. And I'm like, I, I feel sharp. And if there's days where I miss it, I'm kind of like, mm, like I kind of feel like I need that bit of healthy fats um right. to get me through the day because i think some people are scared of that but there's the healthy ones that are so good for us yeah. um and yeah so i try to also organize my diet in that sense like eating for my brain because at the end of the day you could have um a healthy body and everything else if you don't have your cognitive health and, and function it's it's i think it's worse personally i'd rather yeah. be all there mentally um than like having a bad knee or something like that you know what i mean right yeah. so that's another kind of thing that i kind of like to focus on I think I'm just more interested in that um but yeah and then sleep like sleep is sleep is almost I want to say like I think that um overrides like nutrition and exercise like with all the research coming out and we've known that sleep's important for a lot of for a lot of years but a lot of people don't realize that sleep is such an active process yeah. like people think we go to sleep we're not doing anything so it's it's it might not be that important as doing exercise where I'm doing a lot you know there's a there's a great book um, that I just read like a few months ago, uh, months ago called Why We Sleep by, uh, okay. uh, Walk. La last name is Walker, I believe now the first name is escaping me, but he, he has a PhD in, in, in sleep and, and yeah, the, the, the fact of how important sleep is and even the myths around sleep, like this idea of waking up really early and, and changing your circadian rhythm and all these things like things that you know are so promoted like you know you have to get up early in order to be healthy and and be successful yeah. all of those things are just a lot of them are myths and not necessarily necessarily confounded in evidence but uh, it's a great book it's called why we sleep um yeah. but i think it all goes hand in hand too right like I don't think you can have, like you suggest, you can't have good sleep if you're not having good nutrition and if you're not having right. good exercise, right? Like, and I think yeah. I find that myself too. Like if I have a bad meal, especially one that's more like sugar intensive, like with carbs and things like that, like my right. night of sleep is like always thrown off and, and then you feel crappy and it's like a vicious cycle and that's where people get <laughs> lost. And I mean, I deal with a lot of chronic pain patients and, and a lot of what I'm often trying to teach them is like, when you've got this circle of things that happen, you just got to find where you can intervene, right? Like, where's the easy part for you to tackle right now? For some people, it might be you start with the exercise and then things change. For other people, it might be easier for them to start with nutrition. But the point is, is find where you, you think it's easier for you to intervene, intervene to do the right thing in those sense. And then there's a snowball effect. It really is in health. Like, it, sure. it, it sort of sounds cliche to say it, but it really, I, I, I think I... I've seen it personally. I've seen it with uh, friends, family, with patients. The research supports it. It really is this big snowball effect that as you get one thing going, the next thing falls into place and the next thing after that and so on and so forth. 
And then that even yeah. relates to success in terms of business and other things. Because like, I mean, if you're functioning well as a human being, then you're going to have the energy to do different things. You'll have motivation. You might start feeling more yeah. confident. It's all good. There's no, there's no Absolutely. bad around it. Yeah. That's a really good way of explaining it. Um, for anyone who's kind of interested in reading about that, there's a book. You'd probably like it too. You've probably heard of it. It's called it's called the Ripple Effect. So yeah, literally exactly Greg Wells. What you said. He's so, been on this yeah, podcast. Yeah, he's been on this podcast. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, he's phenomenal. And his book really like. So I base I bought that book, and I'm not kidding you. I bought it for my parents. I bought it for my grandparents. I bought it for all my friends who had birthdays that year. It's just Do you such know a his great wife is a chiropractor. No, I didn't know that. So yeah, she, 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 she actually went to, um, to school. She was in my year. And, and, and oh. what, Greg was actually a professor of mine at U of T as well. So no and, way. And, yeah. And then we reconnected awesome. and uh, yeah, he, it's a great book. And, I, and we had a podcast around this and we spoke about that book and I recommend it for people to really check that out. So I'm happy that uh, you're saying that. I'm sure he'll be happy when he sees the clip. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, that's I'll have to go back and look at that podcast. Yeah. But I just remember it being like it's even though he's he's like a he's is he a pediatrician? He no, he's a P he he's he has a PhD in, in respirology, but he did work at sick kids um okay. with pediatric um, respiratory problems. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So even despite him kind of like being this, this doctor um, and having all the knowledge, his book was explained and written in such a way that it was understandable for any lay person, yeah. which I loved about. Him. So and, great, and great. he's, he's the same way as you and I, like where it's like, and one of the things that we talked about when he was on the podcast was like, it's not rocket science, right? Like even on the exercise front, like, you know, he was saying like, go rake leaves. Like if you, all you want to do is rake some leaves, like rake some leaves. If all you want to do is a little bit of gardening, do that. Like this, this is not stuff. And this is where I think it really gets lost um, in terms of, and I think what you've said, and because of so much of what we see, whether it's on television or Instagram, it's always focused on the figure of a human, right? Like you've got to have these washboard abs and this and that. That's where health gets lost, where we're thinking like, oh, that's health, but this isn't health. So, um, you know, I, I think, I think you're, you're on the right track with everything. It sounds like you're, you're having an awesome year. I've, I think I've kept you for about an hour on this, which is usually <laughs> where, where we uh, try to stop. But so just a, you know, a couple things like where can people find yeah. uh, you on Instagram and all that stuff? Cause I, I would encourage people to follow you. I think you do a great job on that um, for Thank all you. of this advice in terms of how, how can you generally be healthy? Yeah. Um, so my Instagram page is Dr. Taryn's Healthy Life. So doctor, like DR with the dot, and then Taryn's Healthy Life. Yeah. Um, I usually use that as my main kind of platform. I also have a Facebook page, which I kind of use my content um, from Instagram on there as well to that population. Um, the clinic that I'm at is called Burlington Sports and Spine Clinic. It's kind of in the heart of Burlington. It's multidisciplinary. Um, absolutely love working there. And yeah, and then my email, if anyone ever has any questions, it's linked on my um, Instagram page, but it's just Thomas at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, Dr. Thomas, it, uh, <laughs> It was very nice to speak with you and catch up. I'm very happy that you're having, I think, I think you're having, you know, the best compliment I think is for me to say you're having a real year. It's not about a good year or a bad. You're having a, you had a, a real first year. And I think that's the most important thing. I, I think it will serve you better than a good year, right? Like it, yeah. it, when you, when you just look back and things are perfect, you don't learn. So I'm happy that you had a real year. It sounds like you're on the right track. You're doing all the right things. Um, in all aspects of your life. And, I, and I'm happy to see that, especially since, again, you were one of my first students in my first uh, small group. So to see you come uh, this far is, is nice. And, and, you know, I wish you all, all the luck uh, in the future and, you know, come back on anytime you want and we can catch yeah, up and, and no, I, keep updating people. I would love to. It was such, such a pleasure. Always great to talk to you and so appreciative of everything that you've taught me with in school and out of school and everything else so it's one you're, of my best mentors. you're just saying that because you're on no, my podcast so it's okay <laughs> my, best, my best mentors and i owe him a lot so thank you i appreciate thank you that so much,